Hello and welcome to Pixel Aquarium. Today I have a very special video for you and it's going to be one of the longer videos I've put out on my channel so far. This is the Fish Iceberg Explained. So I've created a fish iceberg meme and we're going to go down from the most basic fish facts that everyone knows all the way down to some of the most obscure topics in ichthyology itself. So since this is going to be quite a long video, let's just get right into it with the first tier of the iceberg. These are the most basic fish facts and species that everyone knows about. So first you've got your seafood. And seafood just refers to any fish that is really commonly eaten. And that's your tuna, your salmon, your sardines, that sort of thing. These are fish that you encounter every day because you see them every time you go out to eat sushi or when you go to the grocery store in the seafood aisle. So up next we have Shark Week. And Shark Week is one of the biggest fish-related events of the year. Now it's a little bit controversial in ichthyology and fish enthusiast circles because it does often portray sharks as monsters that are out to kill people and it tends to focus on shark attacks and shark bites and how dangerous these animals are when really sharks are generally harmless creatures and in fact while sharks may kill up to a dozen or so people a year the number of sharks that we kill each year I believe is like something in the millions or something like that. So, you know, we are a lot more dangerous to sharks than they are to us. All right, up next we have goldfish. And goldfish just refers to your basic common pet goldfish. I guess we can also kind of include koi in this category because they're very similar fish, but everyone knows goldfish and you know, there is a myth about goldfish that they only have a memory of three seconds or so, but that's not true. I've seen goldfish that have learned tricks like playing soccer. I don't know if I can find a video of that, but I've definitely seen it. Goldfish are quite intelligent fish. They can be taught to learn tricks, and they definitely need a tank larger than a tiny fish bowl that you sit on your desk. If you take them out of the fish bowl, you put them in a pond, they will grow massive. So just keep that in mind if you're planning on housing goldfish. Make sure you have the proper aquarium or pond for them. All right, so we also have the largemouth bass. Now, the largemouth bass is one of the most popular sport fish in the world. Um, of course, you have your Bass Pro Shop. Um, let's just take a look at that lovely Bass Pro Shop pyramid. It's beautiful. It's a monument to fish. Uh, fishing, that sort of thing. It's introduced widely throughout North America and probably the rest of the world, too. Um, I believe it is native to some parts of North America, but it's just introduced as a game fish practically everywhere. So if you're into fishing, this is one of your most basic uh, fishing fish. Okay, so the next thing on the list is Nemo, and this, of course, refers to the popular film Finding Nemo and its main character, who is, of course, an Ocellaris clownfish. Ocellaris clownfish are now one of the most popular saltwater aquarium fish, partially due to the success of the Finding Nemo film, uh, but also because they are quite hardy and are able to be bred within an aquarium, so... They are much more easily available to people in the United States and other non-tropical countries who are looking for uh, saltwater aquarium fish. Clownfish are, of course, well known for their symbiotic relationship with the stinging sea anemone. And they're just a quite colorful and interesting reef fish. So we're moving on down to the second tier, and I think these are things that Maybe not everybody knows about, but if you know a little bit about fish, you probably know about these things, because they're still quite well known. So the next topic in this category is overfishing, and overfishing is a surprisingly complicated topic, 
many species of fish have either historically or are currently being overfished. And while there are a lot of people trying to improve fisheries management and even some uh, fisheries that are actually well managed, there are many fisheries that are under-regulated. There's also a lot of complications surrounding people's livelihoods and the ability to either make a living or gain sustenance from the ocean versus massive corporations coming in and completely fishing out entire regions. So it's quite a complicated topic, but the bottom line is, is that a lot of our current seafood consumption is unsustainable, and in the near future we could see the extinction or just general collapse of many species of fish, and that's concerning enough to earn it a spot on this list. Alright, another thing in this tier is the ocean sunfish, the mola mola, which is its scientific name. This is the heaviest bony fish. It's just a big, beautiful boy. It's an amazing, iconic fish. I think a lot of people know about it, but these are just very odd-looking, wonderfully large fish. I love them. I draw them all the time in pixel art because they just have such an iconic shape. They are known to eat jellyfish in the open ocean, and they also have this interesting behavior where they lie flat on the ocean surface and allow seabirds to come peck parasites out of their skin. So anyways, up next we have the arapaima, and this is one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. I think it's probably not in the top 10 largest freshwater fish because you have to account for things like sturgeon, which I guess it's questionable whether those are purely freshwater fish, but they are quite large. But the arapaima is up there. It can grow up to 3 meters or 10 feet in length, and it lives in the Amazon River Basin. The last thing in this section is river monsters, and that of course refers to the famous television show uh, with the host Jeremy Wade, which is, you know, quite a name for a guy who fishes. Um, and he's a, you know, a professional angler who goes out and catches the largest and what people would call the scariest freshwater fish in the world. So these are giant catfish, um, the previously mentioned arapaima, uh, sturgeon, eels, uh, giant freshwater stingrays, all these things which are just giant monstrous fish. Now, much like Shark Week, many people would say that this show maybe makes fish to be much scarier than they actually are. Most freshwater fish, even the ones on the show, are going to be mostly harmless. They're not really out to eat people, mostly because most of them aren't big enough to actually eat a person. So, maybe the show does demonize fish a little too much, but you know what? I really liked watching the show when I was a kid because it was just fun and entertaining to see these giant freshwater fish. So now we've reached the surface of the water, and we're moving into things that are maybe a little more niche, but I'd still say at least half of people probably know about these fish. Alright, so I just have this category called Animal Crossing Fish. And these are just the fish that I think are well known enough uh, because they're in the game Animal Crossing. I think it's a good parameter because they're just... Animal Crossing has, what, like 80 species of fish in it, and they're all sort of recognizable fish that if you showed somebody a picture of it, they'd maybe be able to give you the common name of the fish, or maybe if not the species name, but, you know, just what kind of fish it generally is, like an eel or like a gar... Um, a hammerhead shark, that sort of thing. Mostly recognizable fish that the general public is somewhat aware of, if not knowledgeable about. In this category, I also have Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik is famous for sort of being a representation of the missing link between fish and tetrapods, um, and of course is mostly famous for the meme, so it's a very interesting transitional fossil. 
and definitely one of the more well-known prehistoric fish. Down here I've also got filter feeding sharks. These are your whale sharks, your megamouth sharks, and your basking sharks. I feel like these sharks are sort of somewhat well known because they are often featured in news stories due to their size. I think they're pretty misunderstood because people think of them as being more dangerous than they actually are. And you know, it's just a whale shark. They're large, but it's no more scary than seeing a humpback whale or a blue whale. So I just wanted to include these here because I think they get a lot of press, but they're often misunderstood. Up next here, and the last uh, thing in this category, we have living fossils. Now, living fossils, of course, are things like coelacanths and gars and maybe both and that sort of thing. These are fish that kind of look prehistoric and they also haven't I don't want to say they haven't evolved as quickly as other fish because of course they're constantly evolving and adapting to their environment but it's more just like their general body plan hasn't changed much in millions and millions of years so you can find say a fossil a fossilized gar from the Cretaceous period and it will look pretty much like a gar that you would pull out of, say, the Louisiana River today. Same with coelacanths, though coelacanths are actually maybe a bad example of a living fossil, because during prehistoric times, the group that they belonged to was much more diverse, including gigantic fish and even species of reef fish, while modern-day coelacanths are relegated to being just deep ocean fauna. Now we're getting into the twilight zone of fish. These are things that I think people who are interested in fish will know a lot about, but uh, if you're not interested in fish, I doubt you'll know very many of these. So first up, I'm going to go with the devil's hole pupfish. Now this is one of my favorite fish just because I think it has a really interesting natural history. Now somewhere in Nevada there is this hole in the ground known as Devil's Hole. Now I don't think we have an accurate measurement of the depth of this hole, but it's quite deep, upwards of 400 to 500 feet deep. And of course as many holes do, it has filled up with water. Now, in the first 30 or 50 feet of this hole, there lives the Devil's Hole pupfish. And this is the only place on Earth that this fish lives. There, of course, is no water for quite some distance around. So we really don't have very much idea of how it actually got into this hole. Some people believe that the pit actually connects way down below the surface to like an underwater cave that goes somewhere else where this fish could have migrated into the pit from. Still others believe that some many thousands of years ago, um, the native people of the area may have actually brought the fish and dumped them into the hole, which is Personally, my favorite theory, even if it isn't 100% realistic or feasible. But I think it's very interesting to think that a species could evolve from somebody dumping fish into a hole thousands of years ago and then leaving them there and forgetting about them. I just think that's quite interesting. I hope it's true. But of course, we would never know because it's been long forgotten. Of course, these fish are also famous for how endangered they are. Uh, I believe in like the 1960s or 70s, somebody wanted to pump a lot of groundwater out of the area and thus lower the water table. Now, these fish are only able to survive because in the hole, there's like a slight shelf that comes out and that's where they live, breed, and eat. 
And so they have this very tiny habitat, and if the water level dropped below that shelf, the fish would have gone extinct. And of course, they, uh, people who like fish were very concerned about this because it's such a unique and interesting to study species. So they uh, filed a court case against it, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so this is a fish that has a, won a Supreme Court case to survive. And I just find that kind of funny. And it's just got such an interesting natural history. I encourage you to look up more about this fish because everything about it is interesting and cool. So up next on the list are the L number plecos. And the L number plecos are a group of catfish in the family Loricaridae, which are not well known to science, but they are very well known in the aquarium trade. So instead of getting scientific names, which can take years, if not decades of research, they get L numbers, which is basically L001 through L427. And these just denote different types of catfish. They aren't species, of course, because they aren't scientifically proven. They could just be color morphs, but they're just distinct types of pleco catfish. They're really beautiful and striking looking fish. They have a very like kind of prehistoric primeval look to them. Some of them are kind of heavily armored. They have striking color patterns, spots, stripes, any color pattern imaginable. These are quite beautiful fish. I love them. I wish I had an aquarium large enough to house these types of fish because they are just amazing to look at. Okay, up next we have lampreys. And of course, lampreys are an interesting species of fish. Unlike all the other fish I have been talking about so far, these are jawless fish. That means they don't have a jaw, which might be obvious given the name, but it's just really weird. They have this like weird sucker mouth that's full of rows and rows of kind of spiraling teeth. It's a very interesting looking fish. Of course, it kind of looks like an eel, but of course, eels have jaws. In fact, they have two sets of jaws, so they have way more jaws than this fish. Uh, lampreys aren't exactly related to other fish. They're kind of related to hagfish, um, but like as far as sharks and, uh, you know, regular bony fish are concerned, these things split off hundreds of millions of years ago. I mean, just way, way in the past that these fish uh, diverged from each other. Of course, fish is kind of a term for many different aquatic animals um, that aren't all exactly, you know, closely related to one another. We are, of course, more closely related to lungfish than lungfish are really closely related to sharks. So there's a lot of you know, evolutionary time between all of these things that we call fish. And lampreys are just a great example of that. They're also well known, uh, the sea lamprey uh, is an invasive species in the Great Lakes, which has unfortunately caused, I believe, several uh, other fish species that are native to the lake to actually go extinct because they use their jawless uh, sucker mouth to latch onto other fish as a parasite. And fish species that aren't used to that sort of predation uh, tend to not do very well. So they're quite a fascinating fish and sort of an ecology lesson and an evolutionary lesson wrapped into one. So, we've made it to the end of part one of the Fish Iceberg Explained. I hope these topics were interesting to you, and I guess if you made it this far in the video, they must have been at least slightly interesting to you. So, thank you for watching, and I just wanted to let you know that the next part in this series should be coming out sometime in the next month, so make sure you subscribe uh, if you like this video, and... Just keep an eye out for part two of the fish iceberg explained. Um, we're going to go into some really obscure fish topics in the next video, and I think it's going to be really interesting and exciting. 
Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.